Hey guys, this is Andrea from Annie in Wonderland, how to experience NDIS. So, this is today, just a bit of a trigger warning straight up. This is a very hot button topic, such a grey area in NDIS. So, I did a bit of a post when I was in a park on restrictive practices. So we'll be doing a bit of more of a deep dive into them and full disclosure that this is just my own research. Again, do your own research, talk to your support teams, both informal and informal support guys. So thank you for being patient with me as well. So for those who haven't seen that video, just a bit of a recap. Restri the restrictive practices under NDIS is something that restricts a person's movement, their environment, access to their funds, food, or the most controversial one is the use of chemical restraints. In Queensland, in Australia, um, in my research, you have to go before QCAT and they have to be used in line with what is called a uh, positive behaviour support plan which is formulated by the care team and the positive behaviour support specialist so generally that is a mental health professional who is trained in trauma and family intervention so this video we'll be talking about restrictive practices in a very general term so when we're saying restricting the environment that is the person can't or it's implied that they can't leave of their own free will the environment that they need to be taken out by a support worker signed in or out by a family member this Obviously, it depends on the person's disability level of function. Sometimes it can be very reasonable and necessary, which is the key foundation of the NDIS. It needs to be linked into their plan goals. So someone who might un not understand to stop at a crossing or may run off. That is an example of a restrictive practice used appropriately however then you get into things like seclusion so where they're put away from a room from other residents isolated to de-escalate them from behaviors that are injurious to themselves or others however this is such a gray area um, in how it's used, how it's managed as well. Again, the person needs to be able to understand the consequences of their actions and act that actions have consequences. So this is a very great area. I'll do a um, whole other one on chemical restraints, but just want to briefly touch on it so chemical restraints I will do a longer blog post on needs a lot more research and time so chemical re restraints are generally and I'm talking again in very broad terms here psychotropic medications that make the person's behavior easier to control or modify the behaviours have got to be injurious to themselves or others. There is now under NDIS, if the person is in disability housing, for their GP or specialist, what they call the appropriate use of medication form. So that ensures that a medication is a last resort. So an example might be someone with a mental health condition having an antidepressant. That's an appropriate usage. Again, I'm not a health practitioner, but that is a general use. Then, 
something might be uh, inappropriate usage might be using a medication to make the person drowsy and sedated so to make someone's job easier however this is such a grey area that there is not actually a lot of information out there because there's two pieces of legislation there's the NDIS Act that I've linked in the blog post then there is the Department of Family and Communities Act and I'm talking from my location state by state by varies but generally it does the person depend on the person's age and living situation to which piece of legislation comes into play generally where I'm located it means that the person is has to be under what they call QCAT guardianship so guardianship is such a hot button topic I'm doing a lot more research on it there's a lot of others who have talked about it with the free Britney movement so I don't want to muddy the waters any further with this one but restrictive practices at times for a person's own good are actually reasonable and necessary and this is the foundation of the NDIS is it reasonable and necessary for the person to live a normal life so does that medication keep them in touch with the reality keep them making good decisions that is a huge one as well so that is a big use and generally if you're in supported independent living depending on your level of function medication will be locked up and you'd have to ask a support worker to administer it there is extra training that a support worker can do on this as well the, so they can do a medication management course because the minimum requirement for a support worker is the certificate three in aged care and disability services I know that a lot of people will be studying this while working on the job fairly common so you have to be able to work with your support workers and not be care resistant if you are have a disability that is also a mental health condition so working with them is a big part of that as well um, however unfortunately it has popped up in my newsfeed not across it that there are some people out there who will abuse it um, it is unfortunate it's key of why I started the blog in the channel to add my voice in a small way about advocacy um, and why I talk about my lived experience I, so guys again thank you for watching please like share subscribe I will see you guys in the next video and remember if you're a person with a disability that you are loved you are matter you are here for a reason and keep fighting see you in the next video